Chapter Twenty Two: The Peterkins at the Farm. Yes, at last they had reached the seaside. After much talking and deliberation, and summer after summer, the journey had been constantly postponed. But here they were at last at the old farm, so called, where seaside attractions had been praised in all the advertisements. And here they were to meet the Sylvesters, who knew all about the place, cousins of Anne Maria Bromwick. Elizabeth Eliza was astonished not to find them there, though she had not expected Anne Maria to join them till the very next day. Their preparations had been so elaborate that at one time the whole thing had seemed hopeless. Yet here they all were. Their trunks, to be sure, had not arrived. But the wagon was to be sent back for them, and, wonderful to tell, they had all their hand baggage safe. Agamemnon had brought his portable electrical machine and apparatus, and the volumes of the encyclopedia that might tell him how to manage it, and Solomon John had his photograph camera. The little boys had used their India rubber boots as portmanteau, filling them to the brim and carrying one in each hand, a very convenient way for traveling, they considered it. But they found on arriving, when they wanted to put their boots directly on for exploration around the house, that it was somewhat inconvenient to have to begin to unpack directly, and scarcely room enough could be found for all the contents in the small chamber allotted to them. There was no room in the house for the electrical machine and camera. Elizabeth Eliza thought that the other boarders were afraid of the machine going off. So an outhouse was found for them, where Agamemnon and Solomon John could arrange them. Mr. Peterkin was much pleased with the old-fashioned porch and low-studded rooms, though the sleeping room seemed a little stuffy at first. Mr. Peterkin was delighted with the admirable order in which the farm was evidently kept. From the first moment he arrived, he gave himself to examining the well-stocked stables and barns, and the fields and the vegetable gardens, which were shown to him by a highly intelligent person, Mr. Atwood, who devoted himself to explaining to Mr. Peterkin all the details of methods in the farming. The rest of the family were disturbed at being so far from the sea, when they found it would take nearly all the afternoon to reach the beach. The advertisements had surely stated that the old farm— was directly on the shore, and that sea-bathing would be exceedingly convenient, which was hardly the case if it took you an hour and a half to walk to it. Mr. Peterkin declared there were always such discrepancies between the advertisements of seaside places and the actual facts, but he was more than satisfied with the farm part, and was glad to remain and admire it, while the rest of the family went to find the beach starting off in a wagon large enough to accommodate them, Agamemnon driving the one horse. Solomon John had depended upon taking the photographs of the family in a row on the beach, but he decided not to take his camera out the first afternoon. This was well, as the sun was already setting when they reached the beach. "'If this wagon were not so shaky,' said Mrs. Peterkin, "'we might drive over every morning for our bath.' The road is very straight, and I suppose Agamemnon can turn on the beach. We should have spent the whole day about it, said Solomon John, in a discouraged tone, unless we can have a quicker horse. Perhaps we should prefer that, said Elizabeth Eliza, a little gloomily, to staying at the house. She had become a little disturbed to find there were not more elegant and fashionable-looking boarders at the farm, and she was disappointed that the Sylvesters had not arrived who would understand the ways of the place. Yet again she was somewhat relieved, for if their trunks did not come until the next day, as was feared, she would have nothing but her travelling dress to wear, which would certainly answer for to-night. She had been busy all the early summer in preparing her dresses for this very watering-place, and as far as appeared she would hardly need them, and was disappointed to have no chance to display them. But, of course, when the Sylvesters and Anne Maria came, all would be different. But they would surely be wasted on the two old ladies she had seen, and on the old man who had lounged about the porch. There were surely not a gentleman among them. 
Agamemnon assured her she could not tell at the seaside, as gentlemen wore their exercise dress, and took a pride in going around in shocking hats and flannel suits. Doubtless they would be dressed for dinner on their return. On their arrival they had been shown to a room to have their meals by themselves, and could not decide whether they were eating dinner or lunch. There was a variety of meat, vegetables, and pie that might come under either name. But Mr. and Mrs. Peterkin were well pleased. "'I had no idea we should have really farm fare,' Mrs. Peterkin said. "'I have not drunk such a tumbler of milk since I was young.' Elizabeth Eliza concluded they ought not to judge from a first meal, as evidently their arrival had not been fully prepared for, in spite of the numerous letters that had been exchanged. The little boys were, however, perfectly satisfied from the moment of their arrival, and one of them had stayed at the farm, declining to go to the beach, as he wished to admire the pigs, cows, and horses. And all the way over to the beach the other little boys were hopping in and out of the wagon, which never went too fast, to pick long mullen stalks for whips to urge on the reluctant horse with, or to gather huckleberries, with which they were rejoiced to find the fields were filled, although as yet the berries were very green. They wanted to stay longer on the beach when they finally reached it, but Mrs. Peterkin and Elizabeth Eliza insisted upon turning directly back, as it was not fair to be late to dinner the very first night. On the whole the party came back cheerful, yet hungry. They found the same old men in the same costume standing against the porch. "'A little seedy, I should say,' said Solomon John. "'Smoking pipes,' said Agamemnon. "'I believe that is the latest style.' The smell of their tobacco is not very agreeable, Mrs. Peterkin was forced to say. There seemed the same uncertainty on their arrival, as to where they were to be put, and as to their meals. Elizabeth Eliza tried to get into conversation with the old ladies, who were wandering in and out of a small sitting-room, but one of them was very deaf, and the other seemed to be a foreigner. She discovered from a moderately tidy maid, by the name of Martha, who seemed a sort of factotum, that there were other ladies in their rooms, too much of invalids to appear. Regular bedridden, Martha had described them, which Elizabeth Eliza did not consider respectful. Mr. Peterkin appeared to come down the slope of the hill behind the house, very cheerful. He had made the tour of the farm, and found it in admirable order. Elizabeth Eliza felt it was time to ask Martha about the next meal and ventured to call it supper as a sort of compromise between dinner and tea. If dinner were expected, she might offend by taking it for granted that it was to be tea, and if they were unused to a late dinner, they might be disturbed if they had only provided a tea. So she asked what was the usual hour for supper, and was surprised when Martha replied, The lady must say, nodding to Mrs. Peterkin, she can have it just when she wants, and just what she wants. This was an unexpected courtesy. Elizabeth Eliza asked when the others had their supper. Oh, they took it a long time ago, Martha answered. If the lady will go out into the kitchen, she can tell what she wants. Bring us in what you have, said Mr. Peterkin, himself quite hungry. If you could cook us a fresh slice of beefsteak, that would be well. Perhaps some eggs, murmured Mrs. Peterkin. Scrambled, cried one of the little boys. Fried potatoes would not be bad, suggested Agamemnon. Couldn't we have some onions, asked the little boy, who had stayed at home, and had noticed the odor of onions when the others had their supper. A pie would come in well, said Solomon John. And some stewed cherries, said the other little boy. Martha fell to laying the table, and the family was much pleased, when, in the course of time, all the dishes they had recommended appeared. Their appetites were admirable, and they pronounced the food the same. "'This is true hospitality,' said Mr. Peterkin, as he cut his juicy beefsteak. "'I know it,' said Elizabeth Eliza, whose spirits began to rise. "'We have not even seen the host and hostess.' She would indeed have been glad to find someone to tell her when the Sylvesters were expected, and why they had not arrived. Her room was in the wing, far from that of Mr. and Mrs. Peterkin, and near the aged, deaf, and foreign ladies, and she was kept awake for some time by perplexed thoughts. She was sure the lady from Philadelphia, under such circumstances, would have written to somebody. But ought she to write to Anne Maria or the Sylvesters? And if she did write, which 
had she better write to. She fully determined to write the first thing in the morning to both parties. But how should she address her letters? Would there be any use in sending to the Sylvester's usual address, which she knew well by this time, merely to say they had not come? Of course the Sylvester's would know they had not come. It would not be the same with Anne Maria. She might, indeed, enclose her letters to their several postmasters. Postmasters were always so obliging, and always knew where people were going to, and where to send their letters. She might at least write two letters, to say that the Peterkins had arrived, and were disappointed not to find the Sylvester's, and she could add that their trunks had not arrived, and perhaps their friends might look out for them on their way. It really seemed a good plan to write. Yet another question came up as how she would get her letters to the post office, as she had already learned it was quite a distance, and in a different direction from the station, where they were to send the next day for their trunks. She went over and over these same questions, kept awake by the coughing and talking of her neighbors, the other side of the thin partition. She was scarcely sorry to be aroused from her uncomfortable sleep by the morning sounds of guinea hens, peacocks, and every other kind of fowl. Mrs. Peterkin expressed her satisfaction at the early breakfast, and declared she was delighted with such genuine farm sounds. They passed the day much as the afternoon before, reaching the beach only in time to turn round to come back for their dinner, which was the appointed time at noon. Mrs. Peterkin was quite satisfied. Such a straight road, and the beach such a safe place to turn around upon. Elizabeth Eliza was not so well pleased. A wagon had been sent to the station for their trunks, which could not be found. They were probably left at the Boston station, or, Mr. Atwood suggested, might have been switched off upon one of the White Mountain trains. There was no use to write any letters, as there was no way to send them. Elizabeth Eliza now almost hoped the Sylvesters would not come, for what should she do if the trunks did not come in all of her new dresses? On her way over to the beach, she had been thinking what she should do with her new foulard and cream-colored sarah if the Sylvesters did not come, and if their time was spent in only driving to the beach and back. But now she would prefer that the Sylvesters would not come until the dresses and the trunks did. All she could find out from inquiry on returning was that another lot was expected on Saturday. The next day she suggested, Suppose we take our dinner with us to the beach and spend the day. The Sylvesters and Anne Maria then would find them on the beach, where her traveling dress would be quite appropriate. I am a little tired, she added, of going back and forward over the same road, but when the rest come, we can vary it. The plan was agreed to, but Mr. Peterkin and the little boys remained to go over the farm again. They had an excellent picnic on the beach, under the shadow of a ledge of sand. They were just putting up their things when they saw a party of people approaching from the other end of the beach. "'I am glad to see some pleasant-looking people at last,' said Elizabeth Eliza, and they all turned to walk toward them. As the other party drew near, she recognized Anne Maria Bromwick, and with her were the Sylvesters, so they proved to be— for she had never seen them before. "'What? You have come in our absence!' exclaimed Elizabeth Eliza. "'And we have been wondering what had become of you,' cried Anne Maria. "'I thought you would be at the farm before us,' said Elizabeth Eliza, to Mr. Sylvester, to whom she was introduced. "'We have been looking for you at the farm,' he was saying to her. "'But we are at the farm,' said Elizabeth Eliza. "'And so are we,' said Anne Maria. "'We have been there two days,' said Mrs. Peterkin. "'And so have we, at the old farm, just at the end of the beach,' said Anne Maria. "'Our farm is old enough,' said Solomon John. "'Whereabouts are you?' asked Mr. Sylvester. Elizabeth Eliza pointed to the road they had come. A smile came over Mr. Sylvester's face. He knew the country well. "'You mean the farmhouse behind the hill, at the end of the road?' he asked. The Peterkins all nodded affirmatively. Anne Maria could not restrain herself, as broad smiles came over the faces of all the party. "'Why, that is the poor house!' she exclaimed. "'The town farm,' Mr. Sylvester explained. The Peterkins were silent for a while. The Sylvesters tried not to laugh. "'There certainly were some disagreeable old men and women there,' said Elizabeth Eliza at last. "'But we have surely been made very comfortable,' Mrs. Peterkin declared. 
a very simple mistake said mr sylvester continuing his amusement your trunks arrived all right at the old farm two days ago let us go back directly said elizabeth eliza as directly as our horse will allow said agamemnon mr sylvester helped them into the wagon your rooms are awaiting you he said why not come with us we want to find mr peterkin before we do anything else said mrs peterkin they rode back in silence till elizabeth eliza said do you suppose they took us for paupers we have not seen any they said solomon john except mr atwood at the entrance of the farmyard mr peterkins met them i have been looking for you he said i have just made a discovery we have made it too said elizabeth eliza we are in the poorhouse how did you find out mrs peterkin asked of mr peterkin mr atwood came to me puzzled with a telegram that had been brought to him from the station which he ought to have got two days ago. It came from a Mr. Peters, whom they were expecting here this week with his wife and boys, to take charge of the establishment. He telegraphed to say he cannot come till Friday. Now Mr. Atwood had supposed we were the Peters, whom he had sent for the day we arrived, not having received this telegram. "'Oh, I see, I see,' said Mrs. Peterkin. "'We did get into a model at the station.' Mr. Atwood met them at the porch. I beg pardon, he said. I hope you have found it comfortable here, and shall be glad to have you stay till Mr. Peter's family comes. At this moment wheels were heard. Mr. Sylvester had arrived with an open wagon to take the Peterkins to the old farm. Martha was waiting within the door, and said to Elizabeth Eliza, Beg pardon, miss, for thinking you was one of the inmates and putting you in that room. We thought it so kind of Mrs. Peters to take you off every day with the other gentlemen that looked so wandering. Elizabeth Eliza did not know whether to laugh or to cry. Mr. Peterkin and the little boys decided to stay at the farm till Friday, but Agamemnon and Solomon John preferred to leave with Mr. Sylvester, and to take their electrical machine and camera when they came for Mr. Peterkin. Mrs. Peterkin was tempted to stay another night, to be wakened once more by the guinea hens. But Elizabeth Eliza bore her off. There was not much packing to be done. She shouted good-bye into the ears of the deaf old lady, and waved her hand to the foreign ones, and glad to bid farewell to the old men with their pipes, leaning against the porch. This time, she said, it is not our trunks that were lost. But we, as a family, said Mrs. Peterkin,